the wild world of the diagnostic lab space, nothing is off limits. Science, compliance, sales, and marketing. Welcome to Lab Results with your host, Blake Bork. Hello, and welcome to Lab Results with Blake. I'm your host, Blake Bork. And today is Genesis Day, the origin story. Why lab results? Why now? And so if you're watching this, uh, more than likely you're in the diagnostic laboratory industry, or you've picked this up because of some sales techniques that I teach. Uh, maybe you're trying to understand healthcare, uh, compliance, science, sales, marketing, or self-mastery. At the end of the day, um, you know, I treat every sales rep that I've ever mentored, coached, employed, worked alongside with like they are a high end performance athlete. I believe that sales athletes are some of the best sales men and women in the game. Uh, and it has a lot to do with their drive and their determination. But it doesn't mean that if you haven't come from an athletic background that you can't be great at sales. Obviously, there are a lot of great sales reps that I've worked with that never played a down of football shot a basketball or baseball, right? Never was in gymnastics, was never a competitive cheerleader. Just saying that the ones that have tend to have a leg up on the competition. And so, you know, I want to talk about a little bit about my athletic background, a little bit about my history in competition and in sales. So that way, as you're picking this episode up and you're like, hey, why should I listen to Blake? What the hell does he know about it? First thing is you're going to get the truth. Um, you know, I believe that connecting with people authentically is, is, you know, my job, uh, being able to peel back a layer of myself and being vulnerable, admitting my faults, uh, being, being able to, to tell the truth and connect inside of a painful place, pain shared is pain divided. Uh, and so I'm constantly looking for ways to be able to connect with my clients and be able to connect with, uh, prospects and, 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 and my coworkers, right? And so in order to be able to do that, you, you need to be authentic inside of yourself. You need to come from a place of integrity. You need to have a, a place of, you know, you understand your soul and you're not wasting energy propping up bullshit stories. And so when you come to this place, the last thing you're going to get is a made up bullshit story. My life has been good enough to, for a Netflix documentary, right? So I'm going to share some of those hard lessons, some of the failures, uh, some of the wins, some of the losses. And I'm going to invite guests on to the podcast that are experts in their industry. So when we talk about, you know, science, compliance, sales, marketing, and self-mastery, I want to bring on people who are experts and ask them challenging questions that will allow us to simplify our processes. Right. I want them to explain some of these complicated compliance. If we're talking about ECRA, we're talking about anti kickback statutes, we're talking about expenses uh, for doctor's offices. Right. And on the flip side of it, then we'll, we'll talk about like sales and, and how to do an in service correctly, um, how to digitally market and hunt on LinkedIn. Um, if we're talking about um, the self mastery aspect. I'm going to bring on some some Navy SEALs and some Marines and some accountability coaches, coaches that help with with breakthrough, right? And I'm and I'm going to lean very heavily on my athletic background, um, and you know my my marriage and my my family and you know the grief that I've exp experienced in both uh, as a, as a reservoir of and a container for you to realize that there's some depth here too. Coach, Coach Blake is what my, my friends and family have called me since I was 11 years old. Ever since I stepped on a football field, I've basically been a coach, a coach on the field and a coach off the field. And so they, they made fun of me, uh, you know, my high school football team, and they called me Coach Blake. And it did not get under my skin because I owned it. Um, I walked on to the Raging Cajuns. Uh, I thought I was going to be a decathlete. And um, then I, my, my freshman year, I actually gained about 25 pounds and I ended up moving from linebacker to um, to fullback. And I was a fullback for uh, four, you know, four straight years. I redshirted then for four straight years. Uh, I was basically the starting fullback in a no fullback offense. 
So it's kind of like I wasn't quite the holder, um, but I was on special teams and uh, and I was a walk on man. It took me it took me literally three years uh, for me to earn my scholarship. Uh, three head coaches, three strength coaches, seven position coaches. And, and, you know, it, it was, it made me, it, it, it shaped me in high school. We, we were a brand new high school. We had two, um, two classes my freshman year, uh, cause it was a brand new school and they put us in a five, a district, my sophomore year without a senior class. So, you know, we were playing in some very adverse situations. You know, we, I played a game as a freshman, then uh, JV, and then varsity. My freshman year, I played something like 27 football games. Um, so, you know, when, when when I think about adversity, when I, when I think about a challenging situation, I played for one of the worst teams in America. <laughs> like it literally in ESPN the magazine, I played for the for the University of Louisiana's Raging Cajuns. And when I was there, uh, just recently, the guys were 13 and one. When I was there, uh, we were like one and 11, a couple years in a row. And so my senior year, we got a new head coach. And when we got the new head coach, a fullback was actually in the offense. And I got to finally play uh, like I had always wanted to play. And I was on special teams. And so I kind of like salvaged my experience there. But I left college early. I left college and I went on um, to become a businessman. I started a tree service. And so um, I had like studied to become a licensed arborist. I owned a crane. I owned a dump truck. I owned a skid steer loader. I chased hurricanes. And uh, I, tell, I tell it like this. I made a million when I was 23. My first million when I was 23. Uh, I... I made my first, I made a million two when I was 22. I spent a million three at 23 and I went bankrupt at 24. You know, if you follow that, I didn't understand money. I had no idea. Uh, I literally filed for bankruptcy on my 25th birthday. Um, I walked into, uh, my, my uncle was a bankruptcy attorney. I probably shouldn't have uh, filed bankruptcy. Um, I just met my future wife. Um, we were together maybe for a couple of months. I had breakfast at her house and, um, she was like, are you sure you want to do this today? And, and her daddy was a banker, a president of a bank. So she knew full well what bankruptcy meant, especially at that age. And I literally went from having a, um, a, a full blown tree service and a television show, uh, where we were doing property and home improvement in my hometown. I went from raging Cajun football player, not star, but player to, you know, a well-established business for a couple of years. I just didn't know how to hold on to my money. And so, you know, the bankruptcy was kind of the first lesson for me on what is it like to be able to kind of rebound and recover. And um, I was at my mom's house and we were talking about how I was like, man, if I just knew about finance, mom, if I just, if I just knew you know, hot, hot debt service coverage, or if I just knew about cash flow, if I just knew about loan to value, I, I wouldn't have spent all my money. And so, you know, I'm drinking a beer, venting to my mom. Uh, next day, I'm drinking a beer, talking about the same thing to my mom. And my, I'll never forget this as long as I live. My mom said, Hey, yesterday you were venting. Today you were bitching. You're going to do something about it because I didn't raise a bitch. And, you know, my mom's five feet tall. And at this time, she's, uh, she's a, you know, a store manager at Macy's. She's a career woman. Um, and she was, a, she was a rock star. Like She really molded me into the manager and the leader that I am today. I learned a lot from her. And she's just one of the hardest working people, both my parents that I've ever met. But she said, I didn't raise a bitch. So you need to do something about it. So I looked at it and it said, okay, strengths, weaknesses. Where was I deficient? I filed for bankruptcy at 25 years old. So that way I would never, I could always look back and say, I'll never do that again. And every year I'll get better and better and better. Where can I learn about uh, finance? Well, I, I didn't want to go back to school. I went back to school actually to finish my general studies degree, but I wasn't going back to school to be an accountant. So I got my general studies degree. I finished it at 25 years old, the December of that year. 
And three months later, I was a personal banker for JP Morgan Chase. So I literally went within about nine months, I went from bankrupt to banker. And when I interviewed for Chase, I had a pre-prepared PowerPoint presentation about myself. I handed it out to everyone who was going to be in the meeting with their names on it. And effectively, I took control over the interview and was able to tell my story the way that I wanted to and disclose to them about going bankrupt and the lessons that I learned and the reasons why I wanted to become a banker. And, uh, and dude, they, they took it hook, line and sinker. I got hired. I was working two days later, studied, got my series six, got my life, health and accident insurance license. And for the next six months, excuse me, for the next six years, I was a banker. Uh, I was a personal banker. Then I got promoted to a private banker. So I was trained by some of the best bank finance trainers in the world, the business of medicine, because when I became a private banker, I focused on um, physician owned hospitals, surgery centers, you know, practices like gastrointestinal practices and family practices. And I got to meet all the doctors in town. I had some lawyers, I had some oil and gas. But mainly it was doctors and I, and I figured out about healthcare finance. The first time I saw the Stark Law, I didn't know what it was. I had to go and Google it and look it up. But I was, I was learning about Stark from the frame of protecting the bank. Because if the physicians got in trouble or violated it, it would put the bank in a negative position. And so like, you know, credit default swaps and everything that happened in 2008 and 2009 when Lehman Brothers disappeared um, and Bear Stearns went away and Wachovia turned into, or Washington Mutual turned into Chase and Wachovia turned into City. I lived through all of that. And um, my, my wife and I, <clears throat> she had an infection very early in her life, um, excuse me, very early in our marriage and caused her to lose um, an ovary and a fallopian tube. And so we, we were put into fertility treatments almost like a year, year and a half into our marriage. We got blessed with twin girls, but unfortunately, uh, Jenny delivered early. She had an infection and the infection caused her to have uh, a, a, like a fetal abruption. Um, and she delivered the baby early. We had Sophia for 12 hours and Charlotte for 72. And so it was really hard um, during that time period, like our, our marriage really went through a lot. And because I played college ball and because I had, um, real pain in my back, uh, I'm going through a spout of depression, um, dependence plus depression, uh, equals addiction. And so our lives spir spiraled out of control. And uh, I went from taking two, two you know, 10 milli milli milligram uh, uh, hydrocodones a day to about 180 milligrams of oxycodone a day and uh, was a full-blown addict. And so it you know, went through about two years of that from 2009 to 2011. I honestly don't remember a whole lot of my life. Uh, put on a whole bunch of weight. Um, I was you know, doing copious amounts of pain meds. And uh, I went in one day to refill my script and the nurse, God bless her, um, knew what was going on with me and stepped in front of, of me and my addiction. And she made me pee in a cup. And when she had me pee in a cup, there was a lot of other stuff that was on that cup that wasn't just the Percocet or the little Roxy's that they were prescribing me. And so she said, you know, these things aren't supposed to be there, Blake. I got to send this off for confirmation. Whatever I get back, um, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to write you any more meds. I mean, I called, I called the doctor. He was on vacation. I called him and said, dude, I, I'm literally, I'm going to be pooping my pants. I'm going to be going into full-blown withdrawals, man. I know I'm bad off, but I need help. And he said, Blake, we can't give you any more help. And he cut me off. I had eight pills left. I called my wife and said, we're going to detox. I drove from the doctor's office and drove straight to a medical, straight to my boss at the bank and sat down in front of him and said, uh, Jerry, and I love Jerry, Jerry, um, I got a problem. I'm addicted to drugs. Um, it's gotten out of control and I don't want to take him anymore. And I'm afraid that if I stop, 
uh, I'm going to die. That's how bad I am. Um, and he said, I had no idea. Whatever I got to do to support you, as much time as you need off, let's get with you with HR right now. So that way we can figure out what type of program the bank has to be able to support you. He said, what's Jenny going to do while you're gone? I said, well, she's coming with me. And so we found a place called Novus Medical Detox. That was the only place in America that would take us uh, as a married couple. And we, we went to St. Petersburg, Florida, and we spent 11, I spent 11 days. She spent 13 or 14 days uh, detoxing off of, of the medications we were on. This is an important story for the lab results because you're going to figure out a theme in my life. I go from bankrupt to banker. I go from addict to toxicology laboratory founder and CEO. Um, I go from grieving father who lost twin girls to adoptive father who has a five and a half uh, beautiful baby girl named Violet and a brand new baby boy who's 11 weeks old named Bruce. And so there's this dark darkness and light that if, if kind of always, you know, there's this dark period and there's this trauma and this traumatic situation and circumstance. And then on the other end of it is this blessing and light and love. And so, you know, the, the, the tighter I've tried to hold on to things and the, the more I've tried to control certain things, um, the less control I prove I actually have. And the, 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 the worse the blow is, because I follow, I follow the thing that I'm holding on to as it's free falling. I follow it all the way to the ground and I crash with it. And so I, I'm in the season of my life personally where it's surrender and let go. And things have been going amazing since I have committed to letting the universe do what the universe wants and me being a witness of it. And so the toxicology laboratory that I started, we impacted about 180,000 lives. Um, we used my addict story and my addiction story as a way to convert the mindset of over 950 doctors. We had a sales force that was growing around the country. We were rocking and rolling. We were the top of our game. We built our own limb system. We had sales reps that were selling compliant. We were not a physician on laboratory. We were doing things by the book. I mean, as much as we could, we invested every dollar that we made over 30 million bucks in three years. We invested every single dollar into the laboratory, into the environmental control systems, into the software, into the processes, into the people, into the build outs, into the equipment. And then um, central region of the U.S. If you were in the talks business and you were in Novitas in 2015 and 16, if I say the name, uh, and the initials are SP. I don't want to get sued. <laughs> You'll know what SP stands for. And you know that that person went out and shut down a whole lot of laboratories. And I was the first laboratory on record that uh, an inspector came in and started asking about stability studies. Um, and so I've gone through the 2567 process. Listen, if you are a, a sales rep and I say 2567, you don't know what the hell I'm talking about. If you are a laboratory compliance expert, the fact that I just dropped 2567 after I told a football and an addiction story, you're probably intrigued right now. So we, we went through, I've gone through ZPIC audits, I've gone through RAC audits, um, we, you know, Medicare inspectors, I've gone through some of the most egregious compliance uh, audits possible because of Miss SP. Really the gift of that whole situation was that I know, I know the dark side of the lab business. I, I, I know what, what auditors are looking for and why they're looking for it. And I have gone through building a very successful business this time, understanding finance, having fiscal discipline, having a day's cash on hand goal, having an amazing HR director, a business intelligence unit, my own software developers and application developers. When I tell you like our company was a work of freaking art, culture and yoga being taught at break, healthy snacks. We had a, we had our, our chief like training officer was a nurse, a health and wellness nurse. And, and he was literally helping people with weight loss goals. Like it was awesome. And then that was all gone, you know, for two reasons. One, in 2016, toxicology reimbursements for Medicare were cut by about 65%. They bundled payments. And two, 
we had a cease and desist that we had to abide by because they said that our toxicology test, because the stability studies weren't done correctly, pose immediate jeopardy. And they basically made us stop testing. It sucked. I got the notice on December 23rd, 2015, the day before Christmas Eve. We literally ruined Christmas. And it came after like months of the inspectors telling us that everything was great. And we had one of the best laboratories they'd ever been in. Like the epitome of a blind side. It took two years and one day and about $10 million in real money spent. We picked up a software in the process when we tried to reopen our laboratory. And because of our knowledge and because of our experience, when we picked up this limb software and we opened the box, we were like, dude, this thing should not be on the market. We had invested, like we tried to work with them. It took us actually probably about nine months to, for us to figure out that this particular piece of software was inoperable. And we had ran out of cash. We ran out of money. And it was a, um, how, what's the best way to say this? Um, it was a danger to patients who were, in, who were put into this software. Right. I'm not saying the name because I don't want to drum up any 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 bad juju, um, but it, it owned by a very large company. And so more of the story is, is we've been under the hood with limb systems. Now <laughs> we understand, you know, how these databases are supposed to be configured. We understand that w- w- what is HIPAA compliance and what is not HIPAA compliance. We know that why there should be roles in place. We understand how to set up the data lake. And, and be able to pull and query information so that way you have dashboards to be able to drive your business. We know the importance of having a CRM. And we, we come from that place. When I say we, I mean the core academy and the consultants that I align myself with. We come from that place because we've been in the shit. Like we literally put it together brick by brick and stone by stone. I remember not being able to tell the difference between a good consultant and a bad consultant. I remember not knowing the right questions to ask. In 2012, whenever I started, 2011, whenever I started on this journey, I got sober, decided I was going to start a toxicology laboratory with two of my best friends. And I Googled on eHow how to start a tox lab. And then from, from there, literally, we bought an amino acid analyzer. We hired a lab manager who literally was the worst hire I've ever had. But we thought she was amazing. There's this thing that you'll hear me talk about, situational leadership, right? And, and, and Rick Arnellis, I'll drop his name because he's still to this day one of the best employees I ever had. And it was a mistake whenever I let him go. That dude was golden through and through. Um, never, never took a day off, uh, worked his ass off, and he taught me so much. There are still lessons that pop up that Rick taught me that, are, that reveal themselves at times in my life where I'm just like thankful for him. Um, but he taught me about situational leadership and specifically that there are, there are, you know, different levels of, of awareness and knowledge that leaders have. And it's how it's important when I'm an alpha and, and, and I'm a quick start and I'm red, be, be brief, be bright, be gone is how I want to read my emails. And so somebody gives me a whole lot of detail and my brain collapses, right? Well, because I'm this red personality, um, I also and I'm a quick start. I also think I'm an expert on most topics because <laughs> I know a little bit about a lot. And some of those topics, I know a lot about a lot. You know, a lot, I know I can go deep in some of them. So when I'm barely like when I just start something and I'm like a D1, very dangerous to be a D1. When you're a D1, you don't even know you're in the room with a D3 or a D4 because you're just trying to figure out where the light switches are. Like you're just looking at the, at the hey, there's some nice paint. You have no idea where you're actually, where you actually are. So the situational awareness inside of leadership is important that you structure a team that has some D4s on it, some D3s on it. D4 is like a master of the master. They forgot more than a D1 will ever know at that stage. D2s are, you know, you're getting into the point where you can, you, you know what you're supposed to do. You understand your role. You know some of the right questions to ask. A D3 is somebody that is actually like 
full, full, full blown, like competent human being. These are probably like your senior vice presidents, your compliance officers, right? But then you have the D4s that are like the gurus, right? You need to search for the D4. Um, you know, you're not going to find a whole lot of them walking around, but there's some D1s in, inside of the lab industry. There's some cults consultants that are straight D1 con men. They know, they know the words, but they don't know what they mean. You know, they can talk about validations. They can talk, they can talk about uh, laboratory compendiums. They can talk about, uh, you know, how to pass an audit and what the auditors really want. And they'll talk about the 70-30 rule. If they, 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 that's it. They're just surface level bullshit. And so at that time in 2011, 12, I, I was a D1 who very quickly thought because I could sell toxicology that I should open up a toxicology lab, right? Because I was selling for a group that didn't like paying their bills. I was selling for a group that every single time I, we, we, we literally, we were doing, you know, a thousand samples a month and we would look at collections and there was always a reason why we were getting paid less and less and less and less and less and less money. Compliance inside of how sales reps are treated has, have never been more important, right? With ECRA and, and the safe harbors inside of the anti-kickback statute and the difference between W-2s and 1099s, I'll give you a, a little, little cheat secret right now. If you want to know what not to do, go to the OIG website and read what people are doing right now and what they're getting arrested and indicted for. It's there. They don't hide it. They literally let you know, like the OIG will publish. This is who we're going after this year. We're going to be going after COVID laboratories this year. And this is what we're looking for. And they just let you know, these are the areas where most of our agents are going to be working in Florida and Louisiana and Texas. Like they tell you, and then if you want to know, well, I wonder if what we're doing is wrong. Go look at the OIG hot sheets. Go look at what they're posting. Google right now, OIG laboratory fraud, and then save that link and then have it send you an alert, <laughs> set a Google alert whenever something from that page is published and you'll literally be on top of what not to do. You'll read it and you'll be like, oh, wow, holy shit, that's what we're doing. That's not a good idea. And then you should stop doing it, right? So we were, were, were running a toxicology laboratory and you know we wanted to model ourselves after Millennium. Millennium pays a $250 million fine for shit that I guarantee you, I told my team 12,000 times, we can't do it. We shouldn't do it. There's no way we can do it. And in the lab business, you'll hear this. You'll hear, well, well. I mean, obviously these guys got a lot of attorneys and they must have, um, they must have approved that, you know? And we, look, I don't know if they were guilty or not. Um, I've worked with some of those people. And, and they're nice people. And I mean, smart as heck. And the guy who was running that crew, he may be a spitting cobra, but uh, he's the best businessman I ever met before in my life. Uh, he's over it. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, like they got some guys over there that got the golden touch and uh, super impressive with them. But we were a small toxicology laboratory. And the lesson here is you cannot compare your situation to anyone else's. Your compliance plan is your compliance plan. Your compliance plan is your compliance plan. From a science standpoint, your validation plan is your validation plan. Depending on the MAC and depending on who your, who your inspectors are going to be, and depending on the state that you're in, from Texas to Louisiana, the, the, the rules for even employment and licensing are completely different. Picking a consultant that understands the science and the validation, like there's some good ones out there. I love Lighthouse. Uh, I love Vachette. Um, uh, I've worked with AMA. I've worked with uh, healthcare, uh, HRC, Health Recon. Um, you, and, then, and then, you know, you have your other than contributors and softwares that you can purchase. I've used a Zyphon in the past. Um, we have, we've, we've subbed out our own billing. Um, we've, we brought billing in house, right? We've, we've done a lot of these things. So you'll, you'll see on the podcast, I'll bring in some RCM and, and some billing and it's, it's gonna be really hard for me to hide some of my real thoughts, 
Um, but I want to give everybody the, the, the opportunity to be able to express themselves and in, in, in their opinion. And it's definitely not a setup whenever I have some experts on, but I'll undoubtedly have some experts that I did not have a good experience with their, with their product or their software. Um, and, and there's a, there's a pretty good chance that whenever that happens, um, you know, you'll see me practice safe distancing and safe space, because I think people have, should have an opportunity to be able to reinvent themselves. They should have an opportunity to be able to retell their story and in software in particular, um, there's always, um, an opportunity to be able to do a new release and to fix the problems that were there and to admit that you didn't get it right and that you improved and now you're, you're going to get it right. So I look forward to, to having some of these, uh, you know, software developers, uh, on it, it, it's, it's, it's key right now. We're in the process of developing a CRM that fits in, um, you know, agnostically a limb system and a revenue cycle management system. So that way sales reps can actually, uh, you know, look and see samples that came in, be able to build in a cog, understand missing information. I need to be able to know what my laboratory's profitability is, not the number of samples that came in. So like, we're going to talk about like what to measure and why to measure it. When, 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 <laughs> when I was a CEO and I was like, we did 7,000 samples this month. We did, we did 6,000 samples. We did 5,000 samples. Like I celebrated every, the volume. I celebrated the number of employees that we had, right? We got 85 employees. We got 115 employees. Like people would say, Hey man, how's your business doing? I'm like, Oh man, last month we did 8,500 samples. We got 165 employees, man. Right. Because I was celebrating the, the, the size of those numbers, right? Well, what, what wasn't told is, is I'm overpaying for 165 employees. I have overbuilt my systems and my operations. Yes, it was like, to me, a work of art. It was a very expensive work of art. And we were building it, not for the company that we were, but the company that we wanted to be. And so when we're, when we're looking at um, you know, what we're measuring and why the measurements are important. You, we're going to talk about these indicators that you need to be paying attention to. There are these key indicators that we're going to look at and missing information is a big deal, right? You're going to hear me preach in heart that if you run the damn sample on a Tuesday and you put out a report Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, you should be dropping the claim the next day. Like these labs that, that aren't dropping billing for 38 days and for, for, for 60 days, it's ridiculous. You're not giving your sales reps an opportunity to be able to train the account the right way. You're not giving your sales team or your service team the ability to be able to get the missing information so that way you as a lab owner can get paid. And the sales reps aren't in control of any of that. But they're going to be looked at for their profitability and they're going to be looked at for, well, your samples aren't paying. Well, shit, my samples aren't paying because I got a revenue cycle management process that's lagging 60 days. And then we find out that there are denials or that there's no information because of credentialing. So I could literally be onboarding bad samples. Yeah, 6,500 samples in a month. That's awesome. 50% of them came from North Carolina Medicaid, and we're not credentialed with them yet. 50% of them came from a Bayou plan from Louisiana. Even if it's 100 samples, it's a complete goose egg that I'm not finding out about 60 days down the road. So as we look at, at the lab industry, it is, it is as much science as it is art. It is a social experiment in problem solving. Like I have never, I am completely in love with diagnostic lab. Like it is, it's my jam, right? And I bring some self-mastery to the party. The sales and the marketing aspect of this is something that's always come natural to me. I don't know why the laboratory industry relies so heavily on cold calling and face-to-face, face-to-face visits. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why um, we zig Ziglar it, why we're still buying lunches 
and doing in services for people who are just don't want to tell us no. I don't know why we have such a hard time connecting with micro decision makers. You know, we have the, the macro decision maker that's the doctor's office that are the doctor or the owner or the provider who says, yeah, this is great for my patients. It's good clinical care. And then we go train the micro decision makers, the practice manager, the infection control person, um, you know, the PAs, and they're not on board with it because it messes up their workflow. I don't understand why sales reps in this business don't understand the, the workflow problem that you can cause and that you're talking to the wrong people about the wrong things. So we, we, we're going to talk a lot about connecting in the painful problem that these micro decision makers have and how to paint a new possibility for them, put them on a path. And then your pitch is just like a little bit, right? Cause you're doing way more talking about the problem than you will selling, right? We're going to do a whole lot of problem solving, not a whole lot of selling. We'll do some telling, but not a whole lot of selling. And so the sales and marketing thing, that's always come kind of easy. The self mastery piece, man, that's honestly like, that's the key to it all right? It's holding yourself accountable. It's realizing that uh, if I don't lead myself, I can't lead my family. And if I can't lead my family, why am I leading a business? And if I can't lead a business, why am I running for public office and trying to lead a community, right? We have people in this world today who can't lead themselves that are trying to lead their communities, we have people who don't, they don't, they don't wake up in the morning and work out. They're not meditating. They're not eating clean or eating right. They're drinking at night. They're getting paranoid with their thoughts. They're waking up the next day, having, having drunk man's thoughts and a sober man's brain. And then they go to work with those paranoid thoughts and those ideas. I'm sober, right? hundred percent sober, no alcohol, no marijuana, no pills. Uh, and it took me, like I broke my drinking bone. Right. And obviously, you know, doing copious amounts of oxycodone will not make you a good entrepreneur. Uh, so it has been for me, my road to sobriety. Unfortunately, I wish it would have been this easy for me, but I just something clicked and I was like, drinking doesn't serve me anymore. You know, when I had my daughter is I, I got to get in shape. I had back surgery and lost 30 pounds and completed a half Ironman. Right. And it's because I had a strong enough why. I didn't have a daughter before, which means I didn't have priorities before, right? So we're going to talk on this podcast about that why that you need to set for yourself. So that way you have a deeper meaning and a deeper purpose because training for the half Ironman was one of the easiest things that I've ever done. Completing it was hard, right? Uh, but I had a why to get up in the morning. I had a jogging stroller and I had one of those things that I strapped her to my chest and she grew up the first three years of her life. She was jogging with daddy or she was on on my chest and we were we were getting it to this day my daughter still loves to be held like that because that's the way that we used to we used to rock it together right and now bruce baby bruce he's about to get the same treatment because i'm going to do the full iron man now so the self-mastery aspect of realizing where you are and being truthful about where you are inside of your body, inside of your, your, your spiritual being inside of your balance and your family unit unit and inside of your business, your wallet, your pocketbook, your paycheck. Like if you're going to get one thing out of this podcast, and I probably should have said that at the beginning, I'm going to teach you how to make money. Making money has been one of the easiest things that I, it's the best thing I know how to do is create value and make money. We're going to recommend books for you to read. We'll go through and talk about those books, right? We're going to drop some gold nuggets and we're going to give an opportunity for you to join us inside of the core Academy and be able to hot seat and use these ideas. Like we're creating a community here where one really doesn't exist and it's needed, man. We need a brotherhood and a sisterhood of diagnostic laboratory sales reps that can come to a place and get advice. You have these little like three, four, five sales rep laboratories and, uh, and no disrespect, but it's sometimes it's like the blind leading the blind. And man, it sure would be great if we had 10 of them clustered together. They're not competing against one another. They're in completely different regions. They talk to completely different people. One's in tox, one's in molecular, the other one's in path, but they're all calling on the same kind of call points. 
they're all dealing with the same objections. They're all trying to figure out a way to get a lead, how to set an appointment, how to, how to create a shift in someone's mindset and compel them to action, right? They're trying to close someone to their commitment and keep them so that way they can create competence. So from a sales and marketing standpoint, you will find the self-mastery piece is what is going to unlock your greatness. And that's ultimately what we care about is our results. Results is in our name. Lab results. Measure me by my results. Don't give me a story. A pipeline meeting is one is like, it's like death to my soul. I hate them. I hate them. I don't want to be lied to. I don't want to hear about your prospects. I don't want to hear hopium. You tell me that they, you know, you're, you're putting them on ice for a little bit. Like, oh, we're going to let, we'll let it cool off a little bit. I'm going to give them a week before, you know, I call them back. So that way they don't think I want the business that, you know, that way they'll give it to me. It's like, this is the most ridiculous shit I've ever heard before in my life. Sales reps that, that use their pipeline as, as a measuring stick. You've got, you know, 15 freaking deals. You had not closed one in 90 days, but it's like, but look at my pipeline, look at my potential, right? It's like a big fluffy, fluffy pillow that you're sleeping on and you're not getting anywhere, right? I can't stand it. And so there will be no, um, <laughs> no emotional uh, landing strip whenever we talk about pipelines and sales reps production. Like we are going to talk about your results. And when you focus on the results and you focus on the psychology of the sale, you know, I was saying this this morning to one of the tribes that I run, you need to be a, a therapist and a psychologist. You, you need to be a, an IT professional who understands HL7 integrations. You need to be a revenue cycle management expert who gets billing and, and, and EOBs and, and, you know, patients being scared. You got to be a help desk professional. You, you need to be an actual sales rep. And, and you kind of need to be some, some, somewhere between a paramedic and, and, an, and an LPN being able to understand the clinical applications. Like you got to be well-rounded to be a diagnostic laboratory sales rep. And if you're not, then you got to be able to learn. And so how we learn, how we memorize, how we are able to recapitulate, right, our day. Like we're going to start working with you on, on meditation and the importance of a memoir and because it helps your memory. And at the end of the day, recapitulating and going back to seeing like inside of the core Academy, we build these chat bots and these chat bots will ask you questions about, you know, what is your, what are you going to do today? Like, you know, on Monday, I got four things that I got to complete. I got four, four main things that I got to do for my week to be successful. Right. And every day I'm trying to knock one of those big things out. Well, you know, at the end of, of, of 12 weeks or a 90 day sprint, if every single day I'm doing something to drive me towards my 90 day target, I got four things a week. I got 12 weeks. I do 48 things. Holy shit, man. It's like most people don't do 48 things in a year <laughs> or in a decade. Right. And so being able to measure your success and create waypoints to let you know if you're on track or off track, like that's what we teach. That's the self-mastery aspect of this. That's holding yourself accountable because at the end of the day, your paycheck and your pocketbook is connected to your body. Your body is connected to your sex life. Your sex life is connected to your happiness and your purpose. Your purpose is connected to the energy that you have at the end of the day to be a great father to be a great leader. Well, that's connected to my body and my ability to be able to have the energy. So that way I can actually propel myself forward all day long, right? It's not propelled by caffeine and sugar, right? I got to build power. I got to practice integrity. I got to practice telling the truth because everything in my entire life has told me to be a nice guy. And that normally means lying to people about how I really feel. And so we do have to kind of break some of that open. I think there's a reason why uh, I work well with athletes and, 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 and men and women who served in the military. It's because I'm a coach and I can't coach 
the person you're pretending to be. I can only coach the person you are, which means that you have to accept that who you are is good enough for the journey. And who you will become on the end of the journey, well, that's how hard you actually want to work and how committed you are to your purpose. How deep is your why, right? So as we traverse science compliance, sales marketing, and self-mastery, we bring on experts to be able to help. I will continue to share ways that I have fucked up royally. I will continue to share ways that, um, that you know, we've kind of struck it rich and what we've done to be able to make things easier for sales reps. And, um, and we will continue to bring you valuable content that is sometimes very time necessary. A couple of things that are going on right now that are very uh, noteworthy. And then our episodes will effectively, what's going on in the lab business, some of our episodes are going to be dictated by the fact that we just need to get the word out. And we need to let people know what's going on and how it's about to impact their lives. So with that, please share this podcast. Uh, you know, like it, subscribe it, drop a comment. Um, and and more, more than anything, give me some feedback. If you got questions about the direction that you want to take your career, there'll be some links that we're going to have inside of the podcast. It's going to be an application and an application for either a conversation or an application for us to be able to share with uh, laboratory CEOs and executives that are hiring, right? So one of the big things we're trying to do here is we're trying to match up right now great labs with great salespeople. Unfortunately, it's hard to find them, right? So we're having an interview process, both for the laboratories that we work with, as well as the sales reps that want to work for them. So with that, guys, look, be great, be yourself. In the meantime, have a great, great day. You've been listening to Lab Results with Blake, and I'm your host, Blake Bork, with a closing message. Our whole target with this podcast is to positively impact the lives of 10,000 sales reps. And the best way we know how to do that is going to be by looking at the share button. The reason why is that's basically you telling us that we've done a good job impacting your life positively. And so you're now giving permission to share that message to your crew. So smash the share button. Let us know that we're doing a good job. Give us a like. That's great too. Subscribe. Absolutely. But the best thing that we can say is by sharing, greatness is contagious. And none of us woke up this morning to be average. We all woke up to be great. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>